everybody, it's Dr. Cody Roll with Tech for Psych. Wow, it is an exciting time to be in the wearable neurotechnology field. In this video, we'll be previewing the mind-boggling specs of Kernel with insights towards the technical capabilities of Kernel Flux and Kernel Flow, initial research projects, cost, and entrepreneurial opportunities. I'm talking to you. Be sure to stick around towards the end of the video where we have interview clips from researchers awarded Kernel devices for their research projects and advice on how you can get involved. Brain data is being thrust into the digital space with heavyweight machine learning, AI, big data, and user interfaces that are going to transform this industry and our lives. The level of data quality is going to be paramount and Kernel has presented technology that many feel is a game-changing modality that brings democratized, crisp, localized brain data into the power of the digital age with unprecedented access to high quality brain data for the individual consumer. How is this possible? Why now? Well, Brian Johnson said in a recent interview that his baseline knowledge of the space was negligible when he started the company in 2016, which actually worked to his advantage. Johnson described speaking to experts and realizing that much of the scientific community had been siloed off from each other through competing through research grants and academic positions and other rivalries. He said that the Kernel team was able to uncover a lot of blind spots like the fact that no custom application specific integrated circuits or ASICs have been developed for FNIRS technologies yet. Johnson wanted to create a wearable device that had fMRI-like quality for tracking the blood flow of the brain and have it be broadly accessible through cost and physical access that had not been done before. One could argue that Kernel has built upon the shoulders of giants because these technologies have been around in theory for a few decades now, but a closer look reveals the amazing innovations that are going on with the hardware of Kernel that could potentially bring brain-computer interface into the mainstream by the end of the decade. Now, one could argue that these technologies have been around for some time, magnetic encephalography and FNIRs, but a closer look shows you how much innovation Kernel has been able to do in order to create this form factor. The creation of these ASIC chips are just a complete game changer and really lead to what Brian Johnson is talking about, which is you can really start imagining these devices being in every home by the end of the decade or 2033 is what he says. And it's just incredible stuff. Now their goal was to dramatically increase access to brain data, but they needed to get a high fidelity of the brain data. And what Brian Johnson talked about in a couple of different interviews is they actually went through an iterative process. So they first built a big hardware platform in order to house the electronics necessary for their time domain near infrared spectroscopy system. And then once they got the fundamentals down, they were able to systematically decrease the size of the chip until it could fit in one of those modules that can fit into the kernel helmet. Now the modules is this amazing concept and we've seen a little bit of that in Neuro Wearable so far. Muse actually had that module on the front of Muse S and they talked about how modules are advantageous because you've actually got the computer hardware that you can load into different forms form factors in order to get the data. And the brilliant part about this is that FNIRS module has a laser in the center and six detectors around it. So it pulses the laser, and this is where we talk about the lasers of kernel in the title of this video. So it pulses these lasers and the laser of red and near infrared light go down and bounce off of the brain tissue. And depending on how oxygenated the blood is of the brain, you'll get different scattering patterns. We've used this signal between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood for many years in neuroscience experiments. Our most sophisticated neuroscience experiments were often done with functional MRI machines in which we used an MRI MRI machine to determine the blood flow of the brain and the activation of the brain. And the fact that we can do this now with the wearable is just totally groundbreaking. And not only that, but um, the FNIR system actually takes more samples per second than a functional MRI scanner would. So you actually get more data in terms of oxygenated blood flow of the brain than you would from an fMRI machine using this device. So it opens up an entire plethora of opportunity. When I first heard about Kernel a few years back, I was actually fearful that they would go for an implantable device like Elon Musk's Neuralink. This would basically make the technology 
inaccessible to the majority of us for many years to come because you would have to get it implanted in your brain for it to work. But as the story goes, Brian Johnson and his team spent two years researching current technologies and then another two years in stealth mode before revealing what they had been working on. So four years since its founding, we have our first look much to the neuro world surprise and delight, they presented plans for two modular helmets that have shown some fascinating new technologies and data. Kernel Flux and Kernel Flow use old concepts in new ways that really make the dream of wearable neuroimaging a possibility. Although we have not yet seen the prototype for Kernel Flux, which is a MEG wearable under development by the company, the potential for this technology cannot be understated. Earlier this year, Kernel released preliminary work using a new technology called optically pumped magnetoencephalography. This basically takes the large bulky MEG machines in the past with large supercooled sensing coils down to small modular units that use alkali vapor and lasers to detect magnetic signals of the brain without need for room shielding. The team demonstrated that they could use MEG to identify what song or speech clips users were listening to through brain signals alone using machine learning protocols from a set of 10 selections. Take a second and use your imagination on what kind of consumer wearables could come out of that technology. That's truly mind-blowing. I'll have to make a video and dive deeper into the MEG technology when they release their prototype, but in the interest of time of this video, we will focus on the Kernel Flow F near device in the Flow 50 program for now. It was not revealed why Kernel released the FNIRS helmet first, but as you will hear from the Kernel Flow 50 researchers say in a moment in this video, the Flow system lends itself incredibly well to research projects that are already in place using fMRI, which adds amazing additional value to medical and industry researchers immediately. Perhaps it was the more obvious initial impact of Kernel Flow that prompted its release first while Kernel Flux is still in development. So how is this whole thing going to be structured? Well, in their live stream in November, they announced the Flow 50 program. So they'll be, they have 50 prototypes this year that they'll be sending out to people. 10 of those will be for free. And they accepted applications and lent out kernel devices to those um, researchers that showed uh, the greatest market or scientific potentials in terms of their research. And what's really exciting is that I actually am talking to two of the researchers today here in the video, so stick around at the end. But... Um, what does that mean for where this company is headed? Well, they're gonna be doing the research with the prototypes this year just to demonstrate the capabilities of this machine. And then um, the other 40 devices will be available for purchase. And then as the years go on in uh, 2022, they'll start mass producing these things and companies and research institutions can start purchasing them to do their neuroscience experiments. Now the modular design allows you to buy as few as four modules of the FNIRS and as many as 52 modules for full head coverage. What's neat is if you want to study a specific area of the brain, maybe auditory or occipital or frontal lobe section, you might not necessarily need full head coverage and can just buy a few modules to get the data that you need to create a wearable device, for example. And that's what they're really encouraging is that companies that actually want to use this technology to make wearables in the future can start working with their hardware right now and collaborating with the company. Now in the live stream, they did say a helmet with four modules would cost around $5,000. We'll see if that pans out. But like a whole head coverage with full-on software and cloud support would cost around $100,000. So obviously this is not within the buying capacity of the individual consumer yet. But you can see where research institutions and different businesses can start uh, investing resources in the hardware now for research and design on how to create wearables that in the future, if you leverage the smartphone and electronic supply chain that we have created over the decades for computers and smartphones, the price of these devices could come down drastically within the couple of hundred dollar range for the average consumer for wearables that kind of like what we've seen over the last 10 years. I really think that what we saw for EEG products between 2010 and 2020 will happen for MEG 
and F nearest between 2020 and 2030. And there might be other modalities that come along that I don't even know about as well. But I think that the high fidelity of these brain imaging devices is going to start becoming really apparent in brain computer interface companies that come out of it. And what we'll see is high priced luxury items that eventually will come down in price for the average consumer to the point at which you could see one in every home by 2033. Obviously there will be a lot of other players and companies that come into this space, but this is definitely the step in the right direction. So let's tune in to two of the Chrono researchers about their research and hear about their advice for you on how to break into this budding industry. Now I wanted to include the full interviews of both Dr. Regente and Dr. Abash on this video, but I didn't want to make the video too long. So here are some amazing pieces about their research and advice for you on how to get into the neuroscience field. I'll be posting the amazing full interviews over the next couple of weeks in their entirety as well. First we have Dr. Nico Regente who earned his PhD from UCLA with a focus in using virtual reality and fMRI to improve the memory of of research subjects. He will be using the kernel flow device to create a virtual reality meditation experience through neurofeedback. So now at the Institute for Advanced Consciousness Studies, which we recently founded and now actually receives um, uh, philanthropic support from the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation, uh, we're currently conducting research leveraging virtual reality and EEG to identify the neural correlates supporting gradations within the meditation meditative experience and how those underpinnings can be leveraged for neurofeedback uh, so as to lower the barrier of entry to meditation um, since you know kind of everybody knows that meditation is is rich with with cognitive and behavioral benefits um, yet still such a small fraction of the population does it pretty a decently lengthy application but pretty free form um so you know it was cool and then like you know i had to have i had an interview with brian and uh their cto as well and they seemed very excited about it because you know it's something that kind of positions it for wide use right like everybody right. can meditate it's like the most innocuous thing you can possibly do uh, so you know it has a lot of it has that large broad appeal yeah it's really exciting to see such uh high quality research going into that um endeavor there's been a lot of startups that people have heard about um in recent years but it, this is uh like heavyweight clinical research that's going on that you're bringing into the field, right? And a lot yeah. of modalities I heard you talk about as well, EEG, fMRI, and then this new one that's coming online with FNIRS. Would you mind telling us how you found out about uh, Kernel and the Flow 50 program and how you ended up applying for that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, so the Kernel Flow 50 is, is an amazing leap forward with FNIRS, which is already a very cool promising technology but suffered from you know a number of different drawbacks um so i had actually heard about it in passing mainly because kernel is, is kind of really close by in los angeles so they're i think they're based out of culver city and we're in santa monica so it's a stone's throw away um but the tiny blue dot foundation had actually made an investment in kernel um, which really piqued my interest um, so i was very intrigued by the technology in general since it's based on a hemodynamic response meaning um you know it, it's 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 a proxy for underlying neural activity as a function of blood local blood flow recruitment to specific regions in the brain and so you know given that fmri is also a hemodynamic based um technology uh i was very curious to see what the cutting edge technology could be for fnirs since it offers a lot of the benefits of fmri but a um, with less of the drawbacks, meaning someone can actually be seated up, they can be, you know, in front of a computer screen, um, they can, you know, produce ambulatory movement. Um, so it's very exciting. And I, and I thought that it would be a great complement to a lot of what we're doing currently at the Institute with meditation, um, given that, you know, setting up an EEG, especially like a, an advanced, you know, 64 channel EEG, you have to, you know, put electro gel into everyone. It's a long setup. It's not really something that people could have at home, right? So when I started to think about the ecological validity of some of the potential proceedings of this work, right, if we, if we do develop some form of uh, neurofeedback that enhances the meditative state or reduces the barrier to entry, how could that actually affect or, or, or like, you know, have some 
of validity in, in the world, right? If not everybody's going to be able to get an EEG system, right? Whereas something like um, FNIRS and, and specifically the kernel flow 50 and, and you know, Brian, the CEO, um, he, he's very bullish on, on making this as prolific as possible, getting into as many hands as possible. So if there's a tool out there that exists and it has a produces a rich enough data set, I think that that enhances the impact, um, the broader both scientific and community impacts um, of the work we're doing here. So I was very intrigued <laughs> by, by the technology and that's why we apl why I applied. So the first thing, and, and this is perhaps more philosophical in nature or for your own personal development is really to identify what it is that makes that you're passionate about, right? Because especially when something is this broad, there are so many different avenues and tributaries that you could follow um, that oftentimes it can become overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. So I like to think of it as, and, and this is kind of the, I mean, I can only speak for my own path, but this is kind of where um, the, or the path I took, which is that, you know, you kind of do a deep dive into the literature of just what continually piques your interest, right? Until you inevitably get to a point where the questions you have do not have answers in the empirical research. And that means then it's you who has to do that, right? So, so you know, for instance, I, I was looking for, you know, markers of gradations of the meditative experience, right? What differentiates a shallow state from a deep state, right? And there's really not anything out there on it, right? So I, that's why now I'm having to develop what seems like a large daunting task, but it's something I'm incredibly passionate about. So it just feels fun and exciting. So I think taking that type of approach or philosophy to it, where you're just trying to dig um, until you kind of understand and really have a feel for what the field is missing. I so love that advice. Of... Yeah, I love that advice. Because to me, what you're describing is you allow your curiosity to keep building up the knowledge base. Mm -hmm. But is there a component of that too, where you also need to let people know what you're doing through publications and in your work so that they're aware that you are doing this so they they come to you with these opportunities yeah that's that's a great point i mean the a, a balance of self promotion is kind of always beneficial right like even if it's just starting up a blog, right? I mean, it's it's hard to get a publication out, right? Especially of empirical research or something that's meaningful. Um, so, you know, if you're a junior researcher, which which I definitely still am, right? Some of the things that that are very good that could be done is is starting up a blog and just talking about things that you're interested in, right? Like, I had started a blog and I've met so many cool people just because I was using specific keywords that no one else was really talking about just because it was interesting to me, right? So you get that built-in kind of search engine optimization to to build your own network. Um, uh, so yeah, there's definitely an element of that, and then also you know. Uh, which goes along with with our our previous discussion is you know starting up writing a review paper about something that you're interested in right so in uh, grad school I teamed up with several researchers uh, that were all kind of doing similar things and we wrote a paper about how virtual reality can increase the e ecological vi validity of uh, memory research right um, so you know things like that where it's like okay. You know, maybe you don't have access to the tools at the moment if you're super junior to run a large empirical study or you don't have the funding. Well, you know, everybody kind of always has the time or, or could make the time to, you know, read through the literature, provide a novel synthesis of it uh, that provides value to the community at large, right? And then that way now your name is out there and associated with the field and, and that lets other people know, you know, what you're working on or what you're interested in. And it's, it's a very good stepping stone. So I, I often suggest things like that as well. Next, we have Dr. Rania Habash, MD, from the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, doing some groundbreaking research on various cognitive disorders that are highly correlated to the eye-brain connectome, which is a very unique viewpoint in this field. Absolutely, yeah. The, uh, the way I, I say it for my patients is, the, your eyeballs are an extension of your brain, you know, and the optic nerve is sort of like the plug that plugs in your eyeball up to your brain. So if there's something wrong with the plug, 
you can't get the signal up to the brain. Um, and that's kind of my layman's explanation for this. But the eye brain connectome, you know, involves, I mean, it's, it's the brain itself. It's an extension of the brain. And so you can learn a lot and you can study a lot about the brain through the eyes and vice versa. So here's a really perfect example. For instance, um, patients with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, we often see changes in the retina before anything happens um, cognitively. So before they have neurodegenerative disease, we're, we're able to pick it up in the eyes first. Um, and the, the same things you know, happen the other way too. So if you looked at the brain and you could study the, um, the signal to the visual cortex, like how strong that signal is, you can actually go backwards and see how much signal transmission is occurring from the optic nerve level. And that's what we do with glaucoma, for instance. We want to stage glaucoma, um, which is damage to the optic nerve. And there's a real simple way to do that. Just look at the visual cortex and see how strong that signal is. I mean, I've, I've been following Brian Johnson. I think he's brilliant. And I've been following Colonel um, and a lot of the brain machine interfaces um, companies like you have, you know, and uh, just following their work for a couple of years now and um, lecturing on it, giving presentations. And, you know, all my colleagues think I'm crazy and out there or whatever, but... <laughs> But, you know, I really believe that this is the next frontier. So I've been following them. And then when Brian came out with the announcement, um, that's when I submitted our proposal on behalf of Bascom Palmer and all our research teams. Um, and so kind of wove four major uh, research projects together um, to apply for the flow device. So it really revolutionized our research. That's amazing. And so does it kind of piggyback on the fMRI studies that you were doing to, tr to track blood flow? Exactly. Right. So, so we're doing the fMRI studies for um, ocular pain. We're doing the glaucoma studies like we talked about. And then a bunch of um, vascular dementia, uh, neurodegenerative di disease like um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, and then multiple sclerosis and stroke patients. I mean, there's unlimited use cases. Um, we've even been using gene therapy lately. And a lot of times it's really hard to gauge the effects of gene therapy unless you look at the visual cortex you know, signal attenuation or the, the signal strength. Um, and so that's a really good application for as well. And you talked a little bit about this before, uh, where you've been interested in the in the brain for a long time and um, been taking a look at these companies. I, I, I speak to students a lot these days that uh, contact me off the YouTube channel, just asking for advice about what career path they should go in. And um, honestly, the brain computer interface field is so widespread right now that it's hard to point anyone in any given direction. But if you could have some advice for someone that uh, would want to do something similar to what you're doing, what would be your advice to be to someone that's uh, coming up through education or thinking about starting a company or wanting to get involved in this field in any way? Yeah, um, I get this question a lot too. They say, what should I major in in college? You know, things like that, but it's impossible to do it that way. You know, you, um, cause, cause it really is applicable to many different fields. I mean, you could do psych, you could do, you know, sociology, you could do philosophy, um, and you can do engineering, of course. So uh, any of those things are fine. I think where I would start first is um, I would tell them to do a lot of reading about um, the devices, the different offerings out there, and the general premise, you know, because uh, brain computer interfacing is like a huge field and there's so many different applications for it. And it's sort of an extension of robotics and cybernetics. You know, we're just getting a little bit smaller and smaller. Um, there's different ways to do it, either injectables versus wearables. I mean, you kind of have to um, get to know the landscape first, and then you can decide what part of it really, really, you know, excites you, um, and then hone in on just that one part. All right, that's it for today. I should mention that Colonel is partnering with the psychedelic research company Cybin, and they made this beautiful video I borrowed for B-roll. So be sure to visit the Colonel website and YouTube page where a lot of today's footage came from for more information want to give them credit there the flow 50 researchers will be receiving their devices and ramping up their projects over the next few months once travel opens up a bit more this summer from the pandemic i will be traveling to film with these researchers in person and give you a first-hand look at the kernel flow devices and their research projects be sure to tune in next week for release of the full interviews of both flow 50 researchers dr regente and dr habash there's a lot more 
more background information on what they are doing and some more context on what you can expect from their research to affect neuro wearables in the very near future. So stay tuned and be sure to subscribe so I can keep bringing you the latest in the field of brain computer interface here on Tech for Psych.